The biggest problem in security that remains unsolved is unprotected attack paths that allow threats to compromise vulnerable targets in the cloud and data center. But traditional micro-segmentation is too complex and time-consuming. There's a better approach. Edgewise Zero Trust Auto Segmentation. Edgewise is impossibly simple micro-segmentation, delivering results immediately with a security outcome that's provable and management that's zero touch. Driven by machine learning, Edgewise automatically builds policies that protect any application in any cloud without any changes to your network. They provide measurable improvement by quantifying attack path risk reduction and verifying software identity before it communicates to stop application compromises and data breaches. To see how to eliminate your network attack surface, visit securityweekly.com forward slash edgewise. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. Uh, quick announcement before we get started. Speaking of, uh, well, we're talking about RSA during the break. The RSA conference is happening uh, February 24th through the 28th this year. It's coming up soon. Thousands of security professionals, forward-thinking innovators, and solutions providers will be uh, discussing and having a lot of fun in a five days of actionable learning, inspiring conversation, and breakthrough ideas. Register before January 24th. Save $900 on a full conference pass. Save an extra $150 if you go to securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC 2020 and use our code to register. All righty. Hey, we're talking about security news. We've got some rye whiskey in hand, and we're ready to dig into it. Where do you want to start? As the first news segment of the year is usually a, not much happens over break. It's a weird time, and it's a weird time for yeah. news. So there was there was one that sort of came out of the whole after Christmas IoT thing, and it, there was some irony in that in one of the the ones that uh, Chris Painter was just talking about that you know a security breach happens and many people f- just forget about it almost immediately mm-hmm. a- and truth um, wise cameras had a massive data breach and the same day that was announced I'm actually looking to buy wise cameras like <coughs> I know they had a data breach but I don't care was that recently the, yeah this um, week yes. this was like two, it's in the three news days, three days ago and, you, and you're a security professional, so yeah. what does that say about the general consumer? Exactly. It says I should it's read the news more carefully. Oh, not We're Larry. We're all numb. <laughs> yep. No. <laughs> it's Lee's I mean, number four, Paul. Gotcha. And, and you, you hear the, the yeah, ring, the ring, uh, the ring breach, and then you see that you know over Christmas and or New Year's shopping, Ring has some of the biggest record sales. So obviously, again. Security and consumers and purchasing do not all correlate and never will. So as security professionals, how do we combat this and push both manufacturers and the technology in which is being pushed to a higher standard? But Tyler, just, right, just Tyler, Tyler I, I have the answer, right? Tyler. We drink? Tyler, this, this is how we deal with it. <laughs> because nobody cares. But, Cheers. But here's the thing, though. I mean, how many of our non techie friends asked us if they should buy a ring doorbell and how many a of us said of mm-hmm. and how many of us said well that's not the thing that's in the news now is not really ring's fault now when ring first that's came t- when ring first came to market they did have a vulnerability where someone could get your wi-fi password mm-hmm. off of the ring doorbell ring very promptly pushed out a fix and I, I tell you if you're producing hardware and software today like you're gonna have vulnerabilities mm-hmm. and it comes down to really your ability to fix them. i mean yes you should not introduce vulnerabilities and have uh you know cicd pipelines that check for that kind of thing and, and that but also you should have the ability to fix something and ring had that years ago i mean that was years ago when yeah. ring came to market and had that vulnerability I, since then i've used a ring i've not heard of any like major vulnerabilities i don't know if you folks have looked at the security of Ring, they're pretty good in terms of yeah. their cameras, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of the cameras that are really bad are the ones where non-name brands, they're coming from China, let's be honest, right? And there's mm-hmm. just their security is atrocious. I think Ring does a good job from what I've seen. And again, I'm kind of a casual observer from the outside. If anyone else has any other information about Ring, all ears, but uh, I think they do a decent job. Yeah, I saw a news report and I forget who it was they were interviewing you, whoever they could scrounge as their cybersecurity expert. And they were Dave talking Kennedy. about I, it, No, it wasn't Dave. It, was, it wasn't anybody I knew or recognized. But they were – and it was like a it was like a local channel. Like they, you know, 
picked up somebody at the bar that they knew somebody's buddy. Uh, I shouldn't say that that's offensive because I'm sure the person's a very smart cyber person. But they were talking, I think, about the wise thing, and they were, and they were, or actually, I don't even think it was the wise. I think it was just in general the 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 whole should you buy all these things like the ring cameras and and not so much the the stuff that happened over christmas but like a week or two before christmas where they you know where there's a news report where you know like a four-year-old was being terrorized by a hacker that was talking to him type of thing yeah through the uh, uh, ring yeah. cam ring cameras are actually through the, the cameras ones. yeah so but the the cybersecurity expert you know his 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 technical response was well you know the stuff's pretty secure as you just said, uh, it, 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 you know, the problem was uh, shared credentials, weak passwords. Uh, so he went on to describe how people should, you know, change the passwords on their Wi-Fi router, change the default passwords on these cameras, don't use the same one. I'm like, well, that's that's deep, but that's about as as deep as anybody's going to go. Mm -hmm. in the, in I the mean, consumer looking world. looking at these consumer products though, and like having to set them up myself, like I've been through. You know, I, I know networking very well, and this is not as intuitive as you would think. The the user interface, the settings, the ability to add them to separate you know Wi-Fi networks and configuring those Wi-Fi networks and all the ports you got to forward, like it's not as easy as like a consumer can just go and make this happen. So, again, we come back to the problem of a consumer product that has to be simple to set up, simple to use, scan a barcode, make it work and be secure and not use the same credentials like we're not going to protect this this is going to have to become a a bigger discussion and there's got to be a out of the box way to help redesign how we actually do iot i think but see i i think we're losing the battle still on all fronts i think there is responsibility that is held by the manufacturer to produce the devices more securely i also think there's responsibility on the users to be able to set that stuff up and have it be secure in terms of passwords. To Tyler, to your point, I also think that manufacturers need to make it easier for consumers, not us as technical people, but consumers to be able to take it out of the box and have it meet some minimum level of security yep. out of the box and make it harder for the user to unravel that stuff. I think we've lost yeah, a lot I of ground on security because we've erred on the side of usability. But like Tyler said, the usability is not even there. So we're losing all around. <laughs> the parallel, and they make, the parallel they make it easy, Paul. Right? <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. The, the parallel, I think, and I think we were talking about this on one of the episodes on the, on the marathon day or in between, but, uh, uh, you know, think of early Windows, you know, PCs that were shipped 20, 25 years ago with Windows 3.1, Windows 95, you know, you name it, and and how much you had to go through to secure those systems mm -hmm. out of the box because they were being designed for plug and play and then <laughs> not fast forward, but come, come up to the, you know, more recent past where you've got Windows 10 where we were talking about how, mm -hmm. you know, they've done a lot to lock it down and secure it and 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 sort of make it user proof idiot proof and and not have to rely on so much stuff i think the same parallel things needs to happen uh iot or any technology we're talking about but i'm not sure that the you know what what drove microsoft to get there i don't i don't think is necessarily going to be the impetus for a lot of these devices, of course, right. you know, ring, maybe ring, maybe had enough sales that they're getting enough re revenue generation. They want to keep that going, that they're going to do it. But, you know, Mark, Microsoft far and away being an industry leader, being so ubiquitous in terms of how many people own PCs. I think that more than anything drove them to get to windows 10 being a fairly secure, having a lot of security built in and you don't really have to think about it as a consumer. You don't think about it as a consumer. But the thing with IoT is it's not just the device and the software or firmware on the device, but it's your log into then their cloud service and the security of the mobile application. It's an ecosystem. Now one could say it's an that, ecosystem. Yeah, it's an ecosystem, but one could Same say Windows Sony. 10 today is an ecosystem. When you build a right. Windows 10 device mm -hmm. today, I want you to create a Microsoft account and yeah. I think Microsoft's done a decent job of securing their entire infrastructure, not just their operating system. So maybe we come back to that mm -hmm. Microsoft is a, a model for how these things should be implemented because this issue is with the credentials, right? And the, yes. I mean, the, one of the fixes 
that works pretty well is to just set up two-factor authentication. Say what you will about two-factor yeah. authentication. In this case, I mean, I went through all of my online uh, accounts for all my devices, mm -hmm. and I mean, most of them had a two-factor, even if it's just SMS, curbs this attack, right? Uh, potentially. Yeah. I mean, there, of course, there's ways around two-factor, but it's a good measure, interim yeah. measure, I think, to secure it. I, I think the utopian is I've got some type of passwordless authentication that can identify me as Paul that doesn't require me to remember a password and or have my phone to prove that it's me to log yeah. into the and, device. And I'd argue the SMS-based 2FA is better than no I agree. At all. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. And all and all the services are starting to push that. So again, back to what we discussed on the uh, the holiday extravaganza. Back to some fundamentals as security practitioners and as what we're advocating for our families and like you know the general public, pushing password managers and two FA. Like these are pretty simple things. You change a phone and even something like Duo. You know, granted, if you have to be on the same platform, but Something like Duo, where you're able to migrate between phones and keep your 2FA yeah. seed. Like, these are pretty yeah. simple problems that they're making this very, very simple. You have a code on your phone, you push an app, you copy this, put it into an app, and now you have a magical 2FA, super secure, elite, you know, my grandson's in security, I know how to do security, right? Like, these are things that the general public needs to continually adopt. And I think the banking industry and financial in general has started to push this. Yeah. They are you know you magically get a 2fa whether you want it or not from chase bank or american express where even if you want to log in they don't recognize this device they're going to send you a backup code to the phone number that's registered so they're forcing 2fa and i think that's a a great step like let's just force the consumer into a model in which they're already getting accustomed to having to put in another form of authentication but and that, if but it that comes took, in a text that's great but that took time tyler and i think people realize general public realizes that they have to protect their financial information and their <laughs> bank accounts right it ties to their bank account right right mm -hmm. but when you're setting up you know a, a camera or a doorbell or whatever i don't think they have that same no. level it of ties, it ties to their nudie it ties to them getting out of the shower and walking down the stairs and you know your ring in your house and your privacy like I think we just have to make those correlations click and tell that story a little bit better. Like, yeah, there's not really a risk. Who cares if someone can access your camera? You don't have anything to hide. Right. Unless Who wants to see you me want people uh, to see you nude as you walk down the stairs or get out of the shower. But you know, the devil's advocate is people are like, "Who wants to see me naked?" <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Well, so, maybe. I mean, if it, if it well, got posted, well, that's a good you would point. Nobody at all. <laughs> <laughs> but there's so, probably come, come someone on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Someone on the back internet to the Microsoft might. analogy mm -hmm. for a second. What Microsoft did is they they basically did it for you. You know, as a consumer, you don't have to be an IT professional to get a Windows 10 machine with the Microsoft infra, in, in, infrastructure protecting you. The, the defenders there, a lot of things are there now, just out of the box, so you can pretty much turn it on and go. Whereas your your Ring or other IoT devices. They're expecting the user to secure it, and the language they're using in terms of how to secure it is not the language that Joe Blow random speaks. They, they're they talking it in terms of sometimes even we don't understand what the settings do. So you've either got to do it for them or put it in terms they understand. I mean, one of the things I really like about Ring, I'm not a Ring user anymore, but I never got rid of my account. We got a notification the other day saying, we think your account's been compromised somewhere. Did you remember to turn on 2FA? And I'm like, what the hell? You're my doorbell provider, not my not my uh, identity theft provider. But that's pretty damn cool. Yeah, and again, uh, so there's like select said, companies. How do, you, how do you get the user happy? And and select companies are really pushing security like that, but not all of the. I mean, think about the choices you have for any type of IoT device. Again, it comes back to whatever's the cheapest. And oh, by the way, it was easier to set up because they didn't have to configure 2FA. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, while we're on devices and such, uh, drones that are flying over Colorado. <laughs> this is a weird story. Yeah, it got, I mean, it, I, it got reported to the news. It was on national news the other day and was it was it? like UFOs. Oh yeah. I saw, I saw the video of it on the news. Was this on new year's when they're like, people are trying to like not do, they're trying to do the ecologically friendly and environment friendly, uh, fireworks with drones. Like when no. No, I'm not even seeing this. Uh, no, this, this is much more. This was much more War of the Worlds type shit going on. 
jeez. <laughs> oh, but the the scary part for me is like n- no one said like really what's going on. They and, just and said it, drones. <laughs> they're just like drones flying above, and no one has come out and said so, it's part of. Are we talking about a, like DJI? Or are we talking like Predator? Like, no one there's knows. A difference here. Uh, no one knows. I hope I think, there's, there is I, a difference. I, I think they were weather balloons. Oh wait, that was. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole different podcast. Sorry. They were gas emissions. Uh, I can't get the story to load, um, of course, when I need. Damn it, I can't either. Like, what is this? What is this I, doing? It was actually Shania on security. Uh, oh. Yeah, he, he had a short snippet and then linked to it, but I, I can't get the New York, New York Times article. There was a New York Times article. Yeah, he that's what he linked to, right? Yep. Uh, but they, so basically, they say I, I think we're all feeling a bit vulnerable to the due to the intrusion of our privacy that we enjoy in our rural community. But they don't have a solution, nor do they have a reason why. Some people have speculated it was government spying uh, and, and all sorts of other, I mean, pick your conspiracy theory there, mm-hmm. right? It's I Colorado. Guess. Like, if they're going to spy, they're going to spy with a satellite. Like, what what advantages are, like, they may be testing some drones, but yeah. honestly. Wait, it was Colorado. Weird. Everybody was high. <laughs> Look at the drones, <laughs> man. Man. Look at those There's like really thousands. This is a, this Which is a one is real? Story. And this, no, and this a, you know what that actually about... means is they were hyper focused, and they actually had a beat on this shit better than the rest of us. Is what it actually means, Jeff. But I, one of the other quotes from Did the they? article was that they were flying high Since enough. The guy had been drinking bourbon for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> they were flying high enough where they couldn't shoot them down. Right? This is rural Colorado, right? People have rifles. <laughs> they were out say, of like, range. There's <laughs> some six five creed moors and some three hundred wind mags out in Colorado. Like we're talking a mile. Some range. Here, so... they, I, that's what I'm. They just didn't have the right. <laughs> Weaponry, or at skills with accuracy, I guess. They sell drone load. He, uh, um, one of the uh, that bullet th- has to come down too. I mean, maybe that's a damn <laughs> show, but <laughs> right? No, it does. Right, so I, yep. I was admit, first thinking, here it is, New, it's New Year's Day, and there was a bunch of articles about New Year's Eve celebrations now using drones in lieu of some of the fireworks they're doing. You know, yep. five hundred or more drones yep. flying in formation. This is not that. No, it was the first thing it, I no, thought of. When want, I, is so it in proximity one, one, to the? Well, oh, a lot of things are in proximity to prisons. There's a lot of uh, the country's actually highest mm. security uh, prisons in so Colorado. Th- the this one was so one of the the folks investigating it said uh, that he estimated there were up to thirty drones uh, flying each night, though not all in the same place. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. And I they mean, were, thirty so, drones is that's a substantial amount of drones. Yep. Yeah. And, it is. Considering if they're more than a mile high, like they're purporting, then obviously yep. these are not a standard commercial drone. Yep, and and so. this this also comes ironically on the heel of some new announcements um, from the FAA, who wants to start um, actually tracking drones in real time, meaning that you're now going to there's proposal that you now will have to put a transmitter on your drone that uh, basically announces who it belongs to and its location. Like a transponder, like for like an a, like an a, like an ADSB type transponder, yes. Or like a like a tracker thing, like those tracker things. If you lose your cell phone or keys, yeah, or no, more 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 like the ADSB aircraft. More like trackings. an actual transponder. All right. So so to play to play kind of the conversation piece here, what does everybody think about utilizing something like a tracker on a drone? Like from a commercial standpoint and from a consumer standpoint, I think that sounds horrible and that sucks. But from an overall safety standpoint and moving forward with, you know, future in mind, like there's going to be a shit ton of drones in the future. Mm -hmm. So what is, you know, what are the benefits and kind of of, what is the things that people see as issues with this? Well, I mean, there's obvious privacy implications, right? If there's 30 drones flying ahead, I mean, that's kind of cause for concern. Are they spying on me? Are they intercepting communications somehow? How good are their cameras? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're flying that high. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, that I think that's going to come down to where we're starting to look at what is on the drone. Like, what is the capability of the drone? You're going to have different classes of cameras that you're going to have to uh, contend with. And then that doesn't even bring into perspective the legislation pieces. Like, is this a two-party recording state where they're able to pick up either audio and or video? And does the other party know, like, at that point, that really sucks from a consumer standpoint. That's going to put a lot of regulation around uh, the production of these. But that also, from a security and privacy standpoint, you know, I would like to know when I'm being recorded. But, again, this is not anything new. We've all had governments and or 
Tyler, corporation, you're being, you're being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> Tyler, you're being recorded. Alexa, right? Right now. yourself. So, my my question is: is okay? We we get a we get a transponder on a drone, and I'm flying around doing doing my normal stuff. But then, what's to prevent me from, say, assuming Larry's transponder? identity when i go do nefarious stuff exactly mm, and, that's and, right. what, and what's to prevent you know folks that have a software defined radio from creating their own transponders well and hmm. then you do that yeah. and then you look at my story number four where i pulled the uh short little snippet from researcher matthew wixie uh who created acoustic cyber weapons wrote custom malicious code that forces bluetooth and wi-fi connected embedded speakers to emit a painfully high volume sound or even high intensity and inaudible frequency that can produce destructive sound levels to the speakers and to the ear. I'm reminded of the Daniel Suarez book, Damon. I was Damon. just going to say, all right, Daniel Suarez. Right, mm -hmm. right. But now combine that with drones, so I fly drones overhead and what, I, what incapacitate What year is that people. Daniel Suarez Hell with book? volume 11. That came out in like 08 or 10, no. 10 or something like that. 16 or 17? No, it's the original uh, Damon? Yeah. 16 or 17 so, years ago. No, no, 2016 or 2017. No, we had Daniel Suarez on the show like back in the day when we were like at my house. I was going to say, I, I was still driving for companies back then, so it was at least 2015, 2014. It was before 2015 because we weren't here in the studio. 2009. I, 2009. I read, a, I read a book that, gosh, back in the 80s, it was probably came out in the 80s that... <laughs> Uh, you know, assassination by sound waves over yes. a phone line. So yes. it's not I mean, a, when, it's when, not is, a new when concept, is Amazon going to buy this technology and then incorporate that into Alexa? Like, all right, Alexa, arm and uh, activate audible decapacitation. Like, this is, you know, this could be a pretty big deal. And then this could be a great way to enforce rules with your children. No, no, wait, no, that's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Alexa, activate. <laughs> Alexa, punish my children. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I like the uh, the wireless uh, collars for the children. Mm -hmm. Much like he's <laughs> with the dogs. Yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well then. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Jeez, I'm glad I wasn't raised by him. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be some serious. My kids were so funny because. When my kids were little, I was still working for the DOD, and I just said, look, there is no assumption of privacy living in this house. Assume you're being monitored. I, I wasn't monitoring them. But, but they uh, just thought. It was, they that, just, it was, it was that, that, imminent, that imminent threat. You weren't monitoring, yeah. but they just think you were. But I just exactly. have to tell my kids that because they use Instagram, and that's, you know, <laughs> maybe, not, maybe not dad that's watching. Could be other people as well. Yeah, I had that conversation with our six-year-old because she got a fire stick for her uh, for a TV in her bedroom so she could play her Nintendo Switch on it. You know, first word problems, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. I, said, I said, you know what daddy does for a living? Daddy catches bad guys on the internet. He knows everything that goes on on the internet in this house. So if you were watching stuff you shouldn't be, I will know. Yeah, till they test that. And then you, they're like, dad, did you see that? Did you see what I watched? I didn't mean to click that. I'm like, yeah, totally seen that. Like. Yeah. Yep. yeah and, don't ever do that again. And guess oh, what? Yeah, and guess what? That. Now you the, lost the, your fire. The answer is, of course I saw that. And now right? you're going to lose your fire stick <laughs> for a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, Dad, it was just Peppa Pig. I'm like, well. Mm -hmm. Peppa got you in trouble. Yep. Sorry. It could be, uh, in, you guys could be included in the most dangerous people on the internet this decade. That's an interesting story. Like, Ooh, who, right? who is on the list? So All it's. Right, uh, well, I want to. I want to hear your thoughts on this. What story is, is this? It is my story number seven, and like this. This looked in. This is a Wired article, and this looked interesting just by the mm -hmm. title. I was like, oh, I kind of, like, I know a <laughs> lot of people, most of which are my friends, that are could be considered dangerous people on the internet. Fortunately, no they're kidding, right? on the good <laughs> side, right? Um, but the first one is Donald Trump. The second one is Vladimir Putin. Uh, Xi Jinping. Mark Zuckerberg, that one I kind of agree with, just not yep. that he himself is on the internet, but Facebook, uh, Julian Assange, and then they just, then they go off the rails, they're talking about ISIS, and... That's uh, not a person. It's, it's, it's anonymous. I would agree, most of these people are not, like, persons, right? They're, they're a entity, yeah. organization, and or capability. And, like, they're not just, like, on the internet. It's not their actions <laughs> on the internet that mm -hmm. largely could even yeah. make them dangerous if 
they were. Their Instagram is pretty dangerous. Uh, yeah. <laughs> They're not even on the internet. They're on Twitter. Yep. A- a- right? a- like, uh, anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> like, who the heck is that guy? Who's anonymous? Like that? Yeah. That's so, so I, I, I question, I, I question the meaning of the word danger, right? Uh, <laughs> I, is... And the meaning of the word internet in this case too. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, right. Wow. Yeah. This, I this, this, this open uh, for debate. Co- the the one of the towards the end there was Cody Wilson. Uh, he's the guy that uh, released the blueprints for the world's first three D printable gun. Oh uh, yeah. And also founded Hatreon. Which is a Patreon type type service that takes donations that funds extremists and white nationalists. See, but yeah, the people that I consider wow. dangerous are not the Cody Wilsons of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's a a brilliant hack, but I think it's the people who are going to print guns and do bad things with them. That mm-hmm. and, and I also just share my thoughts, Tyler. My one thought was I worry about the dangerous people on the internet who are smart enough to do bad things on the internet and have us not know about it know about it and not make anyone's list right yeah honestly if you're on yeah. this list like you're not doing it right mm-hmm. that's yeah kind of that was my, my yeah assertion at this point yeah yeah mm-hmm. so if somebody's sitting back right now and going god damn it i made the list <laughs> you know <laughs> right. it's like oh, where did i go wrong <laughs> yeah, I really need to rethink my career. I'm gonna go cut hair now. <laughs> <laughs> gonna go, oh, gonna go the other that. way. And, uh, I mean, so just to continue along the theme of uh, cybersecurity trends to watch and things are ridiculous articles. First of all, I hate freaking slideshows in posts. Like, oh just god. Don't, don't don't do that. I just want to the the, sli- the slideshows ones that I can do is like if you just keep scrolling and it does the post. Yeah, thing, as opposed and, to and click, yet you're giving click, them the airtime. Click, click. Uh, click. not. I mean, not really. I mean, did we wind up an, with one of those? You shouldn't. But in any case, I mean, Jeff, to your point, why would I include this article? Right? Uh, it, it's just because it's not useful, right? And so, how can we make it better? So, what what are we watching, and what's a trend? <laughs> like, what's the purpose of these? Of the, is there something that we can say in terms of it's new year, there are trends, everyone looks at trends from the past, mm-hmm. trends in the future, like, but what is a trend? Like, what does that mean? What are we, I like, what are we trying to... I like to, the artwork in the 2020, at least. Right? Well, kind of. So, I think they missed a point on their ransomware thing. The new trend in ransomware is they're now exfiltrating your, your, your data that they then encrypted and then releasing it if you don't pay. I don't know. Well, that's like, you know, I think let's that's talk sc- about that's, sabotage. That's more scary than like all your data being encrypted, right? Like if you're talking about major corporations and or like say these municipalities that are getting, you know, handled because they have low budgets for security stuff. Like at that point, you're talking about an entire demographic, an entire state, an entire populace of personal information being released because they didn't either meet the demands and or pay or their stuff's getting released because they have no way or understanding of how to combat this kind of like attack. I think this is actually going to be a pretty big trend within 2020, and it's going to be a big security risk as far as our PII goes. And I think at some point we're going to have to address what is PII, how we identify ourselves, and really make a change uh, in the future to what we consider PII. So. My other concern so, on this is, okay, we pay them not to release the stuff. How many times are we going to have to keep paying them? And they've got they've got the material for extortion mm-hmm. right there. Where with the encryption key, it either worked or it didn't, and you went around it or not. But now they've got your data and they can do whatever. Yeah, you're, That's, you're trusting bad people to do good things and right. pirates to have morals. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong, Tyler? Uh. Nothing, actually. I mean, this is going to be a good year. Pay him. It'll be fine. <laughs> and it complicates totally. the whole pay or not pay thing around too, right? It takes it, kicks it up out of out of the ballpark. And then, and then, don't don't even add in the the possibility. Again, this is like way out in like left field, but cyber insurance. We've talked about this and how ransomware and cyber insurance is handling ransomware, and especially with inside of government organizations, you're talking about particular pay places that are required to use a specific entity in order to address an incident uh, around, say, ransomware, and they're using a specific organization paying out the nose for it based on their insurance policy. And then these people are then negotiating with, you know, they're saying they're not negotiating with terrorists or hackers and they're not conceding to this, but the company in which is being funded by the insurance 
handle the incident is then negotiating and retrieving this data and or negotiating and paying a lot of these ransoms to get the data back. At that point, like, where's the conflict of interest? And we're going to see some serious, like, I think, cyber insurance premiums. Wait, Tyler, and are, you, are you saying the cyber insurance companies are funding the ransomware groups? Pretty sure Just that's like, what he said. Just like <laughs> antivirus companies wrote the viruses back in the day. I don't know if I go quite that far as saying they fund that, but <laughs> it's an interesting say that notion, they're not, though. They're not not right. profiting well, off of these particular pieces. It's you're in a highly corruptible position. That's yes. the way I looked at it. It's going to take a lot of uh, ethics, integrity, and I don't know what. But I think that the that trend will the trend will always be we're going to be defending against attacks that make attackers money, right? Ransomware yeah. just happens to be one of those things right now and how they do it is always going to morph and change but basically the continuing trend will always be criminals want to make money right and that's and they're going to do that using the internet today that is one that is one motivation and a primary motivation of today's threats or today's attackers what we used to call threats in the old days and 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 you're right but just right footholds It, it is but one motivation, right? And we've, I mean, to continue on the ransomware, we've talked last year about how ransomware is used for other things, right? To basically disrupt critical infra- or infrastructure, maybe not critical in the mis- municipalities we've seen, but using it to disrupt infrastructure, using it for uh, nation state style attacks, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so there are other motivators for ransomware. They yeah. don't care about the ransomware. I mean, we've clearly seen attacks where. The, they don't care about the money. I mean, it was it Baltimore? Some one of the municipalities made them a lowball offer of like two hundred thousand dollars, and the ransomware guys in Cal said, "No, no, forget it. We're walking away." Right. So, was your motivation really to to, to make money? Mm-hmm. Mo- most of the time, there's alternative motives and mm. and or maybe there's even political gain at this point. Like. That's the hard part is we don't know the ramifications of what ransomware's, you know, who's behind it and the purported motivation know, in game. At this point, like, can we even rule out the possibility of political ramifications? Say something like Baltimore, the next running for mayor or not even not even going that far. Can you buy services at a reasonable price where you can seed the seat for elections for a small office like i think this is uh this is becoming an issue that mm. a it's not just about the ransomware but b we're going to have to start looking at uh, all the the information the disinformation and what the political gain and or you know end game is for a lot of these particular campaigns you know well, over, over I mean, break keep time. going Keep, I'm sorry, keep going down the rabbit hole, though. I mean, what if the ransomware attack is the deception? It's not the real attack at all. Right. But it's what it's what's tying up the resources I, I would, and the attention. I would argue and, and say that we may or may not have done that in the past where the thing that is being handled, the incident that's being seen, and all of the you know forward pressure that the blue team is having to deal with is to – keep them busy and then the pieces in which we're actually using the the areas in which we don't want to be seen those are the pieces that they're not going to see because they're too busy dealing with all of the other crap the things that you're making a dumpster fire the easy stuff that's well, and it's the that's it's the, the theme of every it's the theme of every die hard movie so yeah right or I mean, a lot yeah. of movies and tv shows right yep. but cuz someone yep. asked me over a break like uh, can you really find anyone that's you know done something nefarious on the internet and my answer was like, it depends on how hard you want to look and how much resources you want to put it, put on that problem, right? And so a lot of these ransomware attacks are happening. If we're not putting the amount of resources to truly find, one, who's behind it, then two, the harder thing, what was really their motivation or the motivation of the person that, that hired them, right? To borrow from like tons <laughs> of movies and TV plots where, you know, the motivation of the person pulling the strings, uh, you know, a la Thanos, right, might be hidden for some for some time. Um, it, are we in that same situation? We really don't know who it is unless we put those resources behind that. And that could be a lot of resources, right, to figure out who did the ransomware attack in Baltimore. How far are you going to go down that rabbit hole? Once you've got everything cleaned up, are you just going to move on with life? And then, like Tyler's saying, was it just a, a, a front for something else? Yeah, I mean, the evidence that's that's left over and or the pieces that 
are not disinformation artifacts or IOCs that are left intentionally. Yeah. Like how much how much can you trust that? Mm-hmm. There, I mean, as we all know, there are artifacts that are really hard to hide. There are artifacts that you can only fake so far. But again, when you're talking about, you know, we'll put APT aside. Go ahead and drink. We'll put like kind of the nation state stuff aside. Looking at a criminal syndicate or someone that doesn't want attribution applied to them, if you put that and apply that to how they're doing a campaign, how they're doing an, an attack, they're you know they're going to be utilizing things that are not going to attribute them. And even if they are attributing them, they're going to attribute to something that is either common or applying to some other group and or situation that you know plays into the whole role that they're trying to portray. You know what's interesting, Tyler. I can't tell whether you're a conspiracy theorist or if you're borrowing from real experiences. <laughs> I really can't. Yes. <laughs> That's very troubling for me. Why not both? Because <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm going back and forth going, wow. That's really... Anyway. It's scary. <laughs> it's very scary. Yeah, we were, we were having moments there. There, there were some, some serious conspiracy theories that, that go on. It's like that crazy conspiracy theorist person who was eventually proved right someday. That would be, yeah, so, that would be so, so it does, you know, it it's gets, not paranoia it gets, when they're actually out to get you. We all know this. Right. Yes, exactly. So, so it gets weird when you're pen testing, right? All of us that are in pen testing, we face moral dilemmas uh, frequently. Yes. Uh, and you <laughs> maybe when you are testing a site that has ruckus Wi-Fi routers, perhaps, uh, Apparently, there was very little security is kind of... I mean, this article made it seem like there was... Like, Ruckus had no security whatsoever uh, applied to any of their hardware and software, which I find a little hard to believe. A little, maybe I would disagree with that because... A little sensational. I can speak to a, a... In fact, Larry and I can both speak to a few incidents in which, you know, we've messed with some Ruckus, both yep. hardware and software, so... I would I wouldn't go as far as saying like maybe by default and out of the box there's mm-hmm. some things that you know are not great, but reading this art- article they make this very one sided and they do. kind of uh, all right so it wasn't yeah, just this me. is this is kind of alluding to it now they do say that the researchers examined firmware from 33 different Ruckus access points and found vulnerabilities in all of them again back to your point Tyler the implementation. Uh, you know, details aside, they were just analyzing the firmware as it as it's how, and right. how old a firmware, like what hardware yeah, are we talking I mean, about? Yeah, here? firmware mm-hmm. and hardware. I mean, with thirty three different devices, Ruckus hasn't come out with thirty three devices in the last yeah, that's five years. That's a lot. So. Well, didn't they also see that the the current firmware for all of them fixed it? That yep. these just had old <laughs> firmware. Yep, the current. Uh, Did see. they say that in the article? Yeah. Ruckus, missed... once upgraded to the latest version, these access points will be protected against recently discovered vulnerabilities. But I wish they, they would say what, like, yeah, they even didn't like say a what baseline of what the vulnerabilities were alluding to. Like, that would help. Well, there... uh, oh, they said they something. Ten different two, vulnerabilities. Ten different vulnerabilities given CD, CVE numbers, and they only list two CVE numbers. So they must be close enough that they don't each warrant their own. Yep, let's see. In fact, uh... or is that one? No, yeah. Two numbers, very close. Two to numbers. Uh, they have three different remote code execution exploit possibilities, uh, built from information and credentials leakage, authentication bypass, command injection, path traversal, stack overflow, and arbitrary file read write. Mm, yeah, two of those I could see. So interesting. Um. Where, yeah. where, that, that kind of flows into, uh, I think, the Citrix one, yes. which is <laughs> super gonna, yes. interesting. Yes. 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 Um, so maybe. So no, uh, there, <laughs> there were no details in here other than what they did say was that the digital workspace and enterprise network vendor Citrix and now in the Citrix application delivery controller ADC. In Citrix Gateway, an unauthenticated attacker could gain remote access to a company's local network, carry out carry out arbitrary code execution, which is like that's like every yep. uh, <coughs> vulnerability announcement remote. Uh, right. You know, well, so yeah, remote so the, access the, the, unauthenticated. The, the announcement. Code. Said, the announcement uh, basically said remote code execution. However, the only thing that's been demonstrated is uh, unauthenticated file upload capability. 
which could be could lead to code. Which also has some different challenges depending on where you upload it. It's to, like a Yoda quote in there. Like file upload can lead to code execution. And then, can lead to then you see code arbitrary execution. code execute. Like yeah. I, I don't know. Like knowing having messed an awful lot with Citrix and Citrix gateways and like this particular product in general. I don't know. I'm so like, they didn't release enough this... details that makes this seem a little bit. This product know, is uh, basically like a remote access. Like I get a, a virtual desktop on something on the inside of my network, essentially. So you can get either a virtual desktop or a virtual application. Yeah. And the virtual application is usually sandboxed and locked into a particular environment. And that environment is typically controlled by both Windows group policy and domain policy and some Citrix application and Citrix uh, remote access gotcha. environment. So policies. it's like a VPN that lets me access certain desktops environments or certain yeah, applications exactly. basically yeah i gotcha so yeah if you could control code execution on the that citrix environment is what they're saying could give you access to the rest of the land essentially you compromise the vpn controller let's say th there's there's a million ways to get like code execution and leverage things with inside like applications with inside of whatever they're providing as far as an application layer goes once you've got access. Mm -hmm. It's the unauthenticated access piece that um like they say unauthenticated access to gain internal access, but then they're being very cagey about how they're explaining what the authenticated access means. Like is it ar arbitrary code execution? Is it file upload or is it actual code execution with inside the environment itself those are very different things and can demonstrate very different vulnerabilities with inside of this yeah, and you wonder how much your configuration changes the the vulnerability mm -hmm. it it's 100 percent the configuration on citrix like mm. all of the all of the stuff that we've ever demonstrated and or shown as far as citrix breakouts environment breakouts uh has always been a configuration issue and best practices issue and citrix has been known to do a pretty decent job around if you follow and configure this properly and you're monitoring and watching how you set up your application at that point yeah you're relatively secure if you're doing the defaults and you're allowing someone into your environment and providing them application access at that point like so there's a you know a ole or some kind of code execution with inside of an application, you're able to execute something or upload a file or open your document. Like at that point, all bets are off, right? You're able to execute something in an environment, in an application that you're allowed to do whatever function that application has. And if you're talking about a Microsoft Office application, a PDF, uh, you know, there's many other examples of this. Microsoft help and support. Like you can do a ton with inside of these environments where it, becomes all bets off and i don't think that you know unless it's a best practices and configuration issue i don't see this as a you know an rce but i could be wrong i'm waiting for some details around like what's been actually released uh lee i want to talk about your story number nine the u.s navy has banned tiktok from government issued mobile <laughs> devices claiming claiming that the chinese developed tiktok is sending pii uh to china the government, Chinese government, well, it's, yeah, it's implied. So it's the uh, the Navy's banning them, the Army's banning them, uh, the Korean Communications Commission is getting all upset that they're sending PII to China. It actually comes. Uh, there's a uh, in, another app they bought that is uh, being used for uh, movie GIF type animation sharing. And it apparently shares a lot of information back with the, the Chinese company. And there's investigations going on about, you know, whether they should be divesting of that on the U.S. side. It's really crazy. Um, this actually started back in October. But the new news is that these government organizations are simply banning the uh, the app on their mobile devices and basically won't be let devices with the app on their network because they're just worried about what kind of data is being exfiltrated by it. A gif, um, a gif, a animated gift sharing I mean, why, app is why that would you gif Slack? Giphy Slack. <laughs> yeah, you, Slack. you know, like, why, um, why I, I have to, I have to admit when I saw the story. Or uh, go, Jeff. Oh, sorry. I when I saw the story, I I am so fucking nerdy that I thought that you were talking about uh, the tier one NTP servers that the Navy hosts. <laughs> Tick and talk, of course. Oh, of yeah. course. How could we forget? 
Tick and talk. It's musically. Yeah, that's it's musically. Service, and thank God for the Navy for tick and talk, right? Um, anyway, I had to. I had to put that in there. Yeah. I mean, I really am curious. Music. Like, from from a business standpoint, or from a operating standpoint, like, why would TikTok be installed on a device in which is connected to a military or government network? Like. Unless we're talking about bring your own device and they're actually letting these phones on a network in which they're worried about data leakage, why why is the installation of stores or apps directly from like an app store or Google Play even allowed? Like why is this not directly locked down? And why are people oh. over the age of 12 TikTok. using TikTok? <laughs> Because the more pressing question articles, here. <laughs> so one of the articles said something along the lines of why are you focusing on an app that's used by a younger demographic than your employees? But I don't think you can assume that. Um, you know, social media app has become parent-child communication has been one way it, it, it's been going. You know, meet them where they are. Uh, I agree, Tyler. Why is this on a government-furnished device or a device on a government network? that doesn't meet security standards. And this is what they're doing. They're raising the bar on the security of the devices that are on their network. Uh, the possible answer is if the particular device policy ask is, is not strictly corporate only, it has personal enable, it allows you to install some personal apps so that um, you can get some personal use out of the device and potentially use it more or have it more useful but it's a device that's known and secured in the facility, so you leave your other devices in the car. Mm -hmm. Along that line, if you know that narrow line of thinking. How, how much evidence do they have that they're actually leaking data to be able to um, enact it? Is it? Are they just erring on the side of caution? or? There's a national security review being done of, of Be Beijing ByteDent Technologies uh, that that has that purchased musically musical who's, dot l y who's doing who's doing that analysis it's classified. Uh, i was looking for that hopefully it was going to do that while you weren't looking well so um, so lee from your thing that one of the said that it was investigating the one group that said it was identify uh, investigating it was the korean communications commission yeah and uh yeah <laughs> Well, Korea trusts China, except where they don't. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, they, uh, I think it's it's a, uh, I, I I think though it's the same core issue. They're worried more and more places are coming coming up saying, "Hey, wait a minute, why why is this information being shared with a adversary?" Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but, I'm, I'm curious actually, who who rang who rang the bell on this and like mm -hmm. what caused the the actual intrigue. Like, is there information being disclosed that has ended up in one of the analysis desks where there's actually some actionable PII that is of concern from a U.S. government device, or is this simply a hey we should look at this because this company is doing interesting things is it and is acquired by an interesting corporation. Interesting question. You're not going to get the answer, Tyler. <laughs> oh, I'm going to find it. <laughs> no, you're not. Oh, yeah. To the Google. Oh, no, there's actually a, um, there was actually, uh, there... and I'm not finding it, there was a congressional uh, request for study filed by, and if I could find the dang article, it's a, it's a senator you recognize. Um, uh, but there's I'm public information, there's classified information, and then there's the classified information that leaks to public. So consider the source. I'm not yeah. saying that there's something nefarious here, but you know, again, there's there's such a thing as disinformation and right. or properly released information that causes disinformation. Uh, that hasn't happened since the early 70s. Oh, well, I was also wondering. probably no better than me. Uh, if if to get that if the base information for this was actually not unclassified at this point, huh. um, interesting. And so that's why I'm not finding it. So, but anyway, yes. <laughs> uh, Jeff, I, I want just to say at this point, yeah, I would stay away from the TikTok app just because it's it feels like a hot potato, and there are if there's there's some there's some 
believable claims about what it's sharing. What is my 12 year old daughter going to do afternoon all afternoon? I know. I, all of our kids use TikTok, which is why we're concerned. Well, I was saying my grandma. Uh, like, how do you get your grandma off TikTok? And, 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 and here I become the hater. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, uh, seven security incidents that cost CISOs their jobs. Yes. I, I, I Largely, I don't agree with this. I think, it, I mean, of course, there is gross negligence, of course, that. Uh, uh, maybe could lead to people losing their jobs, uh, which could be justified. Um, but I think a CISO that has gone through a breach is one you want to keep. I don't disagree with that. I mean, you know, if you look at the list of the the seven companies, you know, you could sort of guess what they were before you looked at the list. Um, and you know, a lot of times, and we joke about you know the life expectancy of a CISO. You know, they're always the one that's the sacrificial lamb, the scapegoat. And it's largely true if you, you know, according to this list. Um, I thought it was interesting that there's a section in the article that talks about, sort of to your point, Paul, if you keep your job, incidents can be good. Mm. Uh, in the sense that incidents are, uh, <laughs> and this I've been preaching this in the PCI world for so many years, uh, you know, incidents are what usually gets the attention of the companies and they start having the right amount of focus and money and resources to actually do the things that they should have been done doing anyway. Um, and, and, you know, like it or not, most companies are motivated by, Oh crap. Now we have to do it because we got caught the risk based decision that most companies make or many companies make is, well, nothing's happened yet. So I, we'll just keep going. Mm. And, and that's unfortunate. And, and that's, that's part of the, the, what probably causes the short life expectancy of CISOs is because they're somewhere they're stuck somewhere in the middle. Yeah, it, I think you're right. I think it's interesting. You know, if you are a CISO and there was a breach, what there are so many factors that contribute to that. Could it be that you CISO was trying to convince the business we need to invest in in invest is a general term, right? Mm -hmm. Time, yeah. money, resources technology yep. right it's all part of it right do we need to invest right. he's saying or she's saying we need to invest more in security uh the business saying no we're not going to is that because the business is just turning a blind eye to it and is doesn't want to acknowledge as a problem or give the proper resources is it the CISO's ability to make a compelling business argument or business case for that technology is it that the CISO and the team maybe chose didn't have the right processes or the right technology or some horrible combination or lack thereof of both right to be able to deal with the incident but my general thinking is the CISO is at a company that had an incident. Now they're going to get the proper resources, potentially. I think mm -hmm. that person is the right person to carry forward that, that plan because they, they know, and, what, and, they and know what, what they did right. They know what they did wrong. Yep. They can work on improving yeah. that. They're in the best position to do that. You bring someone in new. A lot of CISOs I talk to, when they first come into a company, they spend the first three to six months Getting a lay of the land yeah, and, and understanding and the business. You think about this too: is that you know, that CISO that's there, that's going through that incident, is going to get all the things that they need to fix it. They're going to have to do a great job in the response, but, you know, if they're doing a great job in the right. response. That that incident was likely due to decisions that were made by staff that was there before that CISO could be, and yes. a CISO that was there before them, right. and like. I just well, walked into this mess. You, technical debt is a oh, thing, absolutely. right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I was involved in a in a you know post breach uh, PCI assessment back in uh, 2008. Let's say it's a good thing Parl was already drinking when. You and said that. the guy that the uh, he wasn't CISO. His title wasn't CISO, but he was effectively the CISO. He'd only been on the job for like two weeks before this big, huge, major breach was discovered. Mm. And and it was one of these deals where it was uh, the attackers had been in their network for like two years and they never they never discovered it. It was, you know, it was PCI related and the card brands finally figured out, hey, the point of common, this is where all it's coming from, went back to this company. I mean, it was tied to the Gonzalez uh, hacking ring back in the mid-2000s. Yeah. But, you know, the 
the poor guy, he was only there for like two weeks. I mean, he didn't get fired, and but he he got a lot of resources, mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. and 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 it was a it was a huge learning experience for him. In fact, he is the one that gave me my honorary uh, certification, which I carry with me to this day. You're a certified ass. Certified I'm ass. Certified <laughs> ass. <laughs> Application security specialist. That's right. Because it was, great I was honor. tough on him. I, you know, I was like, you know, the requirements say to do this. Why aren't you doing it? You should be looking over here, and this is why. You know, Wait, I was there's, persistent there's enough with There's not many people them. brave enough to call themselves a certified ass. So, well, no. I, it's a badge of honor. <laughs> I'm, pr- I'm proud of you, man. Yeah. Uh, but anyway. Any, uh, there's a couple of uh, cool little technical tidbits. Uh, well, first, but it's, so my number two, hack and git directories. Oh, oh, this is like oh. not a new. Not this that is, kind of number two. Not that number kind of number. Well, I mean, <laughs> it is a pretty crappy situation for a lot of reasons. Um, if your build process is deploying your dot git folder, uh, you got a lot of like <laughs> really like not it just shouldn't happen. I mean, if you isn't that in the default? Get I read this, but I read this article. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah, I think I, I think so. Um, but uh, I mean, your deployment process just shouldn't do that. But in any case, like when I read this article, which was a newer article, and then you do some of the research on it, like a lot of it was being evangelized in 2015. So this is clearly not a new problem, not new solutions. I mean, it's really like th- I mean, maybe three lines in your web server config to <clears throat> like basically wipe this out. I think the important thing that we go back to what we call hygiene, right, is if we have a known problem, We've put in remediations. Maybe that's in our build process. We we're checking that that those folders and other folders and files aren't being uh, pushed to production. And also, there is a protection in our web server that is making sure that you can't access that if it does accidentally get pushed. There should also be I think the reason to learn from this is not the technical aspect. There should be a process that constantly tests for this. And if it does crop up, someone fixes it immediately, right? And I think that's really where the wins are when we talk about a DevOps process and having a CICD pipeline uh, and even speaks to some of the agile development philosophy is let's build the test and make sure that when a test fails, people are looking at it and acting upon that and that we're measuring that. Uh, And I think that's some of the things that these more modern processes and tool chains uh, can do for us to basically make stuff like this a, a really a, it should be a non-issue in most development I mean, that's, environments, that's right? That's like security, though, right, Paul? Like security mm. should be some of the basic fundamentals of security should be a non-issue. Yes. However, they are still an issue, and just like security, like cloud or or whatever you're going to pick for this, you know, phishing or email, like Git is hard for the general public. And so I think just like security, where Git is hard, we fail at the fundamentals. Just like security is hard, the DevOps process is not fully adopted. And is I, I'd argue, Tyler, that it, it, Git, Git is hard for, for a lot of people in the general public. I just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it could go down a rabbit hole in any case. Like yeah. I have. Yeah. Sometimes committing's not yeah not doesn't go over so well in any case yeah. i mean commi- commitment's a big deal <laughs> it is it is commit dash m quote <laughs> i have commitment issues unquote yes no i, I think this will that become a, a bigger issues. issue though as as more software platforms and more shops are beginning to do the development life cycle and beginning a devops process just like security right where they're adopting a security process in the security life cycle and integrating that into their IT solution, uh, I believe Dev is going to be the same the same kind of pathway. And I think we're starting down that path when you take it like 2009, 2010, where the DevOps process is starting to have to adopt and uh, correlate and integrate itself into both security and or IT at that point. And many organizations are finding themselves in a point where you know that's why this story has made headlines is because it's not fully out there in the public it's not fully adopted there's not regulation around it and it's not you know it's not a common practice as people that haven't been doing it well sorry i lost my train of thought because i sneezed really really hard (laughs) Uh, it would like reset my brain uh oh but if you look on the internet but the reason why this is probably someone took it upon themselves to write an article because if you look on the internet you can hit a lot of websites and find the the git directory right (laughs) because 
people haven't adopted these processes and it it could be that or people don't know what to look for or some of these attacks get so old and kind of crusty that they fall off and we don't necessarily check for them and so they they come back around right so there's a lot of conditions that can lead to stuff like this that is very well known right that ends up in modern web applications i mean it's stuff that you folks as pen testers bank on right it's basically stuff like this yeah it's people may know about it but it's there because there were checks and balances that that just weren't either in place or improper processes the same thing with malware we, we talked last year about uh some of the like older malware uh, techniques inside of malware are coming back around again as evasions for endpoint some endpoint security solutions because they've updated the checking in algorithm so many times to get the more modern implementations of a technique that they're missing out on some of the like really older stuff and missing those those checks that's kind of to me that's kind of scary as to what do we recommend you know devops checks for is just one aspect of it how do we make sure that their processes and everything is comes full circle and make sure you're always checking for everything just like security i don't think you're going to get to that point like that's the goal and as security is not a destination it's a continual process right uh we're just going to have to continually work on that uh, also, a really uh, neat little uh, article from the SANS uh, Incident Handler's uh, diary. Um, ransomware that was developed in Node.js. That was pretty cool. Yeah. No way. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, surpri I'm surprised it took this long for it to become a public and known thing. Like, of all the things that have been developed with inside of Node.js and a lot of the attacks we've seen leveraging some kind of Node.js, like, I'm surprised ransomware took this long. Right? They need to get on the hipster train <laughs> sooner. And, and they, need, they need an agile DevOps <laughs> process. That it it makes me wonder, right? <laughs> if they're developing you know, in Node, they're presenting at their own little conferences way in the shadows about malware DevOps processes, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Payload DevOps processes, yeah. Ah, uh, any other stories? One that I thought was uh, pretty fascinating was uh, Jeff's number three, a password breach of uh, Zynga Corporation. Uh, oh, Zynga, uh, as Jeff alluded to, made Mafia Wars? Is that the... Uh, nope. No, well, maybe, but... Uh, the uh, one Mafia Wars, like, on like, the... the like Palm Pilot? <laughs> yeah, the, well, well the, one, the one that they really took off for uh, like Zynga... Like Facebook, as, like, they, 12 yeah, years ago. Like, they do yeah, tons yeah. of... They do tons of games, uh, yep, and uh, the biggest one that I think they do is Words with Friends. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yep. So, for the and record... How many, and how many consumers, just mere mortals, as we've been talking to over the course of the evening, that have Zynga accounts, the password on their Zynga right. account is the same as their, you know, whatever, their bank account, their router. Exactly. The, for, their, for, ring, their ring device. For the, so for, for the record, I know my wife plays Words with Friends quite frequently, so I went and, have I been pwned, has already got the list there. <laughs> uh, and yeah, sure enough, she was in the, in the list. Change the passwords. Yep. Yeah. It's January Hopefully 1st. that wasn't a password second. scheme. Change your passwords. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you just change, you change it from password to password one, you're good. Yep, that's it. Um, In this case, maybe. Well, 19 maybe. to 20. It's time to update. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, winter. Yeah. Winter 2020. 2020. There you go. <laughs> and you're good. Well, that will conclude this episode of Paul's Security <laughs> Weekly. Thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. Larry, take us out. Over and... <laughs> <laughs>